the state of the map conference didn't use to have introductory talks because in the early years we always assumed that everyone was coming was an open street map geek anyway but we figured that this time with a conference that big we have a couple of people who are new to OSM or who may be just coming from one very specific angle and who would be interested in uh, seeing a, a larger picture. My name is Frederick Ram. And I'm Thomas Skovgon. And we have 90 minutes together. And we want to get you on a ride through the OSM universe. We want to show you how it all started, how it works, how you can use it. And we want to show you the idea in a couple of slides, maybe. Yeah? We, we've prepared a few, I would say. Yeah? <laughs> But um, yeah, maybe we won't put you to sleep just yet. Uh, in, instead of that ton of slides that we threatened, we have prepared a couple of, uh, invited a couple of guests. People always say that OpenStreetMap is a map or OpenStreetMap is a database. But while all these things might be true, most of all, OpenStreetMap is the sum of its people. All the people who are building something, who are doing something with OpenStreetMap, all the mappers, all people at the conference, and so on. And that's why we want to kind of stress the people aspect by having a couple of guests talk about what they are doing with OpenStreetMap or what they have done in the past. So do we want to tell who's coming? Nah, this is a secret. Yeah. OK, OK, then <coughs> let's just start. And we often hear this thing, OpenStreetMap, the Wikimedia, the Wikipedia of maps. Uh, fortunately, Wikimedia hasn't sued us for trademark yet. Uh, careful, careful, we, we are on camera. Oh, uh, all right. Um, so just like with Wikipedia, everyone can contribute to OpenStreetMap. And it's, it has been an idea that has had to start, and now it has to grow and spread, and it evolves every year. And uh, our friends at uh, Tillenough, they, I think five years ago, something like that, they uh, made a small video about the development of uh, OpenStreetMap across the world. And uh, you can see it. Yeah, and uh, yeah, this is London, and now it spreads out through uh, Central Europe. Now you see more of Europe, and you see where, like, everywhere it's spreading around, and there is some areas are brighter than others, and you see across the pond in the US, a lot of stuff is happening, and yeah, we see um, 2010 already. A lot of data has been already contributed, and yeah, it evolves every month and every day. And uh, yeah, as you might have seen, the video uh, has started in London because that's where OpenStreetMap has started. Everywhere on else on the planet, the map was empty in 2004, and um, yeah, 2004. That was when uh, Steve Coast a uh, computer science student in London, um, wanted to play around with geodata, but really there hasn't been any because, uh, yeah, UK didn't have any open access uh, geodata. This story is a bit different in, for example, the US, where um, taxpayer-funded projects are under the public domain, and this hasn't really caught up in Europe so maybe uh, only just in the last few years. And maybe that's a good thing, because if there was open data, Steve Coast wouldn't have needed to do it on his own. And yeah, we wouldn't have OpenStreetMap. So, Felix, you're a bit longer around than me. A bit more gray hair also. <laughs> what, what was it like back then? Well, I, I wasn't around when the project started. I joined okay. in uh, 2006, um, when, when they had already done quite a bit in England. Um, in Karlsruhe, where I lived, um, yeah, that, and actually, Germany was relatively empty when I started. So, was there anything on the map yet? Or how did it look like? Ka Karlsruhe, well, do Karlsruhe specifically was an exception because uh, there were a couple of active people there that, that had mapped quite a bit in Karlsruhe, but there were many other places in Germany in 2006 where you had maybe, maybe the autobahn going past, mm -hmm. but no details whatsoever. So, you know, in the early days, 
Um, we didn't. It's not like today where you have aerial imagery and you can just draw everything off right. the imagery and trace it. Um, it was GPS only. So we had these. Uh, maybe some of some of you know these uh, old yellow Garmin E-Trex things with variable precision, and that was the main data source. So people actually walked around with the GPS devices, took traces, recorded them, uh, recorded waypoints whenever you were passing any interesting bit, uh, like post box or something, write everything down on a piece of pen and paper, and then process it when you're back home. Um, of course, with technology like that, you, you can't do any like tracing building footprints or something. You can, you can do streets and a couple of PUIs, and, and that was basically it. Yeah. So when did you start organizing with like, conferences like these? Well, I remember, I remember going, we had, I was at a State of the Map in 2000, and seven. That was wow. uh, the first set of the map, uh, and I brought a huge uh, a print out from the of the Karlsruhe map because we yeah. were so proud, and we said, "Yeah, Karlsruhe is now complete." Um, In two thousand seven. That was <laughs> what we defined as complete. Yeah, and I brought that print out to well, the basically OSM. I mean. Taking that to England, where OSM was started, was of course like a bit like, "Hey, look here, we in Germany did this nice thing." And, uh, Look at, look at us, uh, we're, we're beating you at your own game. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, uh, Karlsruhe was exceptional in Germany in that they were relatively early. So when Karlsruhe has been already complete since 2007, what have you done in the last 12 years? As I said, the, um, we, we were a bit audacious when we said, the map is complete. It was basically, we had all the streets, um, we had no buildings, um, we had only a limited number of POIs. And I mean, people start in inventing new stuff in OSM all the time. A lot, lots, of, lots of the things that we map nowadays, like opening hours or so, um, they weren't done in, in those days. We had streets, street types, street names, a couple of POIs, and that was it. Nowadays, I've, for, for example, I mean, people map, people map opening hours, people map what kind of food you can get in a restaurant. Um, I've been started in Karlsruhe, I've recently started mapping individual trees. You know, <laughs> um, there's lots of this. Oh, it's never complete, really. Right. You can always find something. So mapping parties are now very popular. Have you taken part in those two? Mapping parties are, I think they were more popular in the GPS times. Yeah. The, the very first mapping party was in 2006. Uh, on the Isle of Wight with uh, Steve Coase and a couple of people in England. I wasn't there, I just read about this, but as kind of that, that was where they, uh, where they coined the, the term mapping party and they were about 30 people uh, setting themselves the goal of mapping the Isle of Wight in one weekend, coming together, dividing up the, the island, and some people on foot, some with a car, some with a bike, you know, depending on what mode of travel you have, you map mm. different things. And they said, okay, let's divide this up, and then they did these things. Um, we've copied that, of course, we've done lots of mapping parties in Germany as well, um, especially when you do the GPS acquisition, it's, it's nice to meet in the morning and say, okay, you take this, you take this, you take this, and then you swarm out and everyone does something, and then we come back together and uh, fill, the, fill in the stuff in the editor. I have a feeling that it's not happening that much nowadays anymore, mm. but uh, yeah, your mileage may vary. Yeah. So you've also been doing a lot of OSM advocacy. You uh, have been holding a lot of talks on different conferences. You gave a lot of interviews, I think. You've even written a book uh, together with Jochen Topf. I think it was the very first one. And um, mm. yeah, but how were the reactions in the early days of OpenStreetMap? Of course, I mean, when we started big in Germany in 2006 or 2007, we already had something to show because we could rely on what, what people had done in England. We could pick some things and say, look, it's working. Um, of course, it's, uh, if, if, if they, uh, kudos, kudos to, to them for, for doing that because it must have been very hard in the early days. For us, it was a bit easier, but still, of course, telling someone in uh, how OpenStreetMap is working, someone from the press or, or someone 
people would always say, this is never going to work, right. and, and you had to do a lot of, uh, you had to a lot of, talk to them a lot until they would understand that it could perhaps really work. So yeah, also uh, we had um, people from the government or commercial people involved in, in cartography who didn't like the competition. <laughs> but for everyone who said that it's never going to work, there were always like a handful of nerds who say, hey, this is interesting, show me how it goes. So, I mean, it's an open project. Was the license like a big topic where this openness came from, or is it just a side thing? I think what, what people attracted to OpenStreetMap was, was twofold. Some people came to it because it was just the, first, um, just the first way in which they could start making their own map. Like if you were a cyclist, you could, uh, you could be using the standard maps that, would, that were made for motorists, most likely. And people came, hey, this is great. We can finally make maps that are centered on cycling and not on, on motoring. Um, but we also had lots of people who said that, that, coming from the open software, open knowledge background, saying, this is great. You have an open license, uh, uh, share-like license. This is what we like. It's um, the, the same license that Wikipedia has. Um, we, we support that. So that's uh, oh, certainly a factor. Yeah. And, but um, I mean, this, the whole thing evolved, obviously, in the years. And uh, I, I remember the license switch discussions. Like, I think yeah, it was around the time that, I that, joined the project. That was, that was a long and, 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 and ugly discussion during which we lost a couple of people and a couple of bit of data also. Um, we changed, or we, we had the, the Creative Commons share-like license before that yeah. Wikipedia is also using. And then the license basically means, well, you can, you, you can do anything with the data uh, as long as you attribute OSM and as long as anything you make from OSM has the same license as the share-like component. Um, the new license, it's more or less the same. And, and with hindsight, you, you wonder why we could spend so much time haggling over the details. Um, there are some minor details, but yeah, we switched the license and now we are relatively happy with the open database license, which is still an attribution share like license. Right. Okay. So Good. Thank you. Thank you for the insights of the early days. Um, that was just, uh, just for starters. <laughs> now, maybe we, should be, maybe we should give a short kind of technical introduction so that people know how things work, yeah. basically. Okay. Yeah. Um, Sure. Um, so, um, it's actually pretty simple if you think about it. Um, we have a central database that has, as you see, all the things. And um, it also stores not only the, the things that are current, but also all the history that uh, has passed. Um, then there is the API around this database, so you can actually talk to, to the database. Um, then we have uh, some software out in the wild, some editors that are able to uh, communicate with this API and add data and retrieve data. And, um, but if you want all the data to have it for your own and don't want to go to the API every time, you can also get the planet. That's how we call it. And this is uh, basically the pre representation of everything. You also can get it with all the history if you want. And um, then there's um, the diffing mechanism, so you can get minutely updates without having to get all the planet data every time you want to have an update. And um, yeah, you can use this planet and those diffs to operate your own services. For example, we as OpenStreetMap, uh, we have a map on OpenStreetMap.org. And this is using the exact mechanism to get the data and um, work it for, with it and um, yeah, um, consume it for in your application that you want. Yeah. And your, you can insert your thing that you want to do with OpenStreetMap in there and you can imagine what you can do, right? Yeah, the data model that we have is also quite simple. Um, uh, the most basic element is a node. That's just a point that has certain coordinates with it. Um, a, a node can also mean something. It can be a tree or a post box or the, the location of a city center or something. 
Um, but you can also take a couple of nodes and combine them into what we then call a way. And a way, that's just a line. We use that to model, for example, roads or a canal or also a power line or something like that. If you have a way that is closed, falls back onto itself, then that's an area, a polygon, that can be used for, say, a lake or a forest or a building. And finally, we have a slightly more compli complicated object that we call a relation. Relation is a, part, uh, a combination of a couple of other elements, like a couple of ways or even nodes. And these relations are mostly used, for example, uh, to model country boundaries or uh, long distance hiking routes or even complicated things like turn restrictions or so. That's the basics of the data model. Um, in order to um, describe what something is, we use tags. Tags are just combinations of keys and values. And for example, if you have a tree, the tag would be natural equals tree. Uh, highway equals residential, waterway equals canal for a canal, or boundary equals administrative for, a, um, uh, for a, an administrative boundary. Um, the, the tags are not just these simple tags. There's um, about 75,000 different tags in use. <coughs> 90% of those are spelling errors? Well, yes, <laughs> but there's still several hundred tags that are used more than 100,000 times. Um, and the, way, the tags that I've shown you here are the, the basic tags, but we would also have tags that describe, uh, for example, for a tree, not only that it is a tree, but how high it is and what species it is or something. Or for a street, we would also map whether the parking, or we can map whether the parking along the street is in parallel or diagonal or whatever. So lots of detail like street road surfaces or speed limits and so on and so on. But yeah, this is tags. You, you can invent any tags you like, um, but these are, the, the, these are basic tags that, that we use in OpenStreetMap to model what is what. Yeah, so maybe let's now do some mapping. How about that? Um, let's, let's look into it, how you can do um, your very first contribution um, using the OpenStreetMap website. So uh, let's open some browser of your choice. Um, go to OpenStreetMap.org. And um, usually you can just go there and sign up for an account and uh, you just specify username and password, you confirm the sign up uh, using the link you get via email, and um, yeah, that's it. Uh, luckily, I already have an account, so I'll just log in. With a terribly long password. And I think I mistyped, no, I typed it right. Perfect. Um, so, once you have an account, you can log in, and you can now go um, and um, choose some place on planet Earth. Let's go to Heidelberg, somewhere around here. I think we're somewhere in this area, I think, right? And now we can just push the edit button, which doesn't work because my standard editor is not installed here, but we can use ID, which is the browser-based editor. And you don't have to have anything installed. You can just start here. Um, normally, ID presents you with an uh, um, introduction dialog, so you can uh, have a walkthrough and learn. But uh, we don't need it for now, because I'm here. Um, so you notice that um, the, displaying of the, the display of the map has changed. It's not uh, like this clean, schematic, um, representation, there is much more detail. You now see aerial imagery in the background and you see a lot of annotations down here that are happening and you can point at them and things show up and they show you what, what tags are attached to it and so on. And um, 
So you can, you can click here, for example, let's click on the building and then you will see, um, oh, it's actually a bit more complicated than I thought, maybe let's click another building. They're all very complicated, but um, you can just look here and then you see all the tags that are included there. So you see the address, you see a type, you see if there is an elevator and so on and so on. And um, we, can, um, we can also add something to the map. It's pretty easy. Let's just imagine there was a tree somewhere. As Frederick already told, he's mapping trees, so maybe let's map a tree as well. It doesn't really exist, so please don't map trees where there, are any, uh, there aren't any. Um, but you can uh, just type in tree. You could even select a leaf type. For example, is it maybe a leafless tree? Is it evergreen? You can even select the diameter. Yeah? You, can, you can say, okay, maybe it's 300 millimeters or something like that. Yeah, and that's basically it. You now have mapped a tree. Um, we can even hit the upload button here. And then you can specify what you did there or why you did it. Uh, type in a few words, edit imaginary tree. And uh, you can even ask for help so someone else shall review your, your change, but I won't do it because I'm totally sure this tree is right there. And uh, then I can hit the upload button and it just goes to, to the database. Don't worry, I will remove it afterwards. Right, so what Thomas has shown, shown you there is the ID editor, that's the, the, the default editor that comes up when you press the edit button on the website. But this isn't the only editor, there's a couple of, well, when OpenStreetMap started, the first thing that we had was a Java applet. That was the first editor, that was before my time, and then we went through a couple of, uh, of um, Flash-based browser editors and finally have arrived at ID, which is done in JavaScript. Uh, but in addition to the browser-based editors, um, there's also standalone standalone editors like uh, Josm, um, and of course a number of mobile editors, and also a couple of special-use programs um, that will not allow you to edit anything but maybe just uh, a very specific property, like whether something has wheelchair access or something. Um, we have three guests about the editors, and we are going to ask them some questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Simon Poole, um, Vincent Privat, and Quincy Morgan. Yeah, we have, we have pre prepared something for them, for them to wear so that, uh, there you go. so that you know who is who. Uh, thanks, I guess. <laughs> okay, there you go. Right. I'll, Quincy, I'll start with you and, and uh, ask you a couple of questions ab about the idea. Did, did Thomas do everything all right? Uh, we need a microphone for you. Hello. Hello. Yeah, take this. Did uh, Thomas make any major mistakes right there? Uh, well, there wasn't any trees, so that's one major mistake right <laughs> away. <laughs> that's uh, right. Uh, no, um, with ID, we try to make it really easy to use, very hard to make mistakes. So if you're making a lot of mistakes, it's probably our fault, so let us know. <laughs> <laughs> So the idea editor has kind of the pole position among the OSM editors because it is the default editor that new people will be sent to when they hit the edit button on the website. And it's basically you and um, your colleague Brian Housel who are the main editor, the, the main contributors to ID. How does it feel working on something where you know that every edit, every new thing that you push, push out will be used by, I don't know, 30,000 people over the next couple of weeks? Uh, yeah, it's a big responsibility, um, but there's also, on the editor stats page, it says there are 200,000 unique user accounts that used ID last year, so a lot of people come, they just make a few edits, um, don't, never been to a conference like this, don't know a lot about OpenStreetMap necessarily, but they just want to map their community, so we try to make it easy for those people as well as the, uh, the, the 30,000 enthusiasts or whatnot. Right, okay. So, unlike... Unlike the other editor writers, uh, you're actually uh, getting paid for, for the job. I, I could imagine that a couple of people might say, hey, that's, 
that's really cool. I would love to, to get money for uh, working on OSM software. Is it a dream job? Uh, yeah, <laughs> like, I'm a you know, young professional. I already have my dream job, nowhere to go but down. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a joy to, to w wake up every day and work on um, OpenStreetMap uh, and be able to be part of this great community and uh, try to make the map better. Can, can we ask who is footing the bill for the work? Yeah, I work for Critigen LLC. It's a US-based company. They have offices in Seattle, uh, Denver, and London, I think. Um, so they're a GIS-focused consultancy. So they use OpenStreetMap data for a lot of things. Um, so to have somebody there supporting the project, making sure the data is going to be uh, great for them and their clients is a benefit to them. Right. What's, uh, since you've been contributing to, uh, to ID, what's the, the, the coolest thing that you've added where you said, that was really the, a really great feature? Well, I've, I've only been working on ID less than a year. Um, I was volunteering before that, though. So um, sometimes your volunteer position can turn into a, a full-time job. Um, we uh, built a validation tool last year. So now if you make common mistakes, uh, that it'll let you know that and try to help you fix them easily. Uh, so I think that um, is sort of a game changer in terms of uh, data quality, hopefully. All right. Is there, is there like, would you say that your work in ID has some, some overarching goal or, or general principle that you're working towards? Yeah, well, sort of our, uh, sort of our, my, the user in my mind that we try to work for is sort of the casual um, OpenStreetMap user who doesn't necessarily need to know all the, uh, the data types or the tags, you can just go in, um, you know, add a point, tag it as a tree, uh, and kind of make that an easy thing to do. So um, usability is, is our big uh, focus, um, even for advanced features to make sure they're usable. Right. Okay. Let's uh, ask some questions about Josem. Hi, Frederick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I so, uh, <laughs> Vincent, you're uh, one of the most active developers of JOSM right now, I think. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's the Java-based uh, OpenStreetMap editor, and um, it's also the, the oldest editor, I think. Yeah, it was created only, only um, one year after OSM itself. So 2005 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. 14 years from now. And it has also the largest code base, as we can see. Uh, okay, yeah. the, the red thing are the plugins, but uh, yeah, other than that, um, it sounds like a lot of work, and also yeah. to, to to keep moving and to stay motivated. Yeah, with 14 years of development and the tons of feature we have in the editor, it requires a lot of work to understand all the code base, but it requires even more work as we have a lot of users, a big community to handle all the stuff happening around JOSM. Yeah. So how much time do you spend weekly on working with, on, on, uh, on JOSM? Well, it varies. Uh, we are a team of a few developers, but we are all benevolent. We are not paid. So all the work we do on JOSM is taken from our free time, like all, uh, all everyone that contributes to OpenStreetMap. So, Personally, for me, as I am the most active developer in the team, I usually spend between five up to 20 hours per week oh. to JOSM. Oh, that, that's, that's quite a chunk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we already heard that uh, ID is the default editor on um, OpenStreetMap, but who are the people who are using JOSM? What are the differences between those editors? The target audience is not the same. Uh, ID remains, wishes to remain simple and accessible to everyone, especially for beginners. Unlike JOSM, who is more targeted to experienced users, uh, wishing to find more powerful, but sometimes more complex features. And we have different use cases. Uh, JOSM is an offline editor, you don't need uh, an internet connection or a good internet connection. So we have a lot of users in the humanitarian sector. Uh, for example, when they go to African countries where internet access is a spare resource, uh, JOSM is very valuable uh, because they can download a lot of things before and work without internet connection. Yeah. Uh, other features are for power mappers 
uh, we like to do uh, most powerful stuff like uh, handling massive amount of data uh, or very complex features. Okay. So do you still add new features to JOSM or is it just software architecture fixing bugs, keeping up with updates and so on? Not especially architecture, but yeah. Uh, all the stuff happening around JOSM require more time than coding itself uh, new features. Uh, for example, um, where I spend a large amount of time is to uh, triage tickets created on the website, answering questions from the community by email or social media, uh, monitoring the validate, valid, uh, validity of external resources, and so on. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Over to Simon. Simon, the um, Vespucci editor is not only uh, on the smallest screen of the three, but it's also the one with the smallest developer base. It's more or less just you, is it? Well, historically not really. I mean, one of the interesting things about Vespucci is that it's over 10 years old. This March it was got its, had its first decade, which is very, very, very old for an Android app. And uh, there's been a row of people um, that have maintained it. I've been doing it for the last five years or so, and it is mainly me, but if you look back, it's always been one person, essentially. Um, the code base has expanded substantially over the time that I've maintained it. You could say, ah, uh, Simon's working here, and it's bloating. But um, yeah, it, it, it's uh, a fair amount of work. The day only has 48 hours, so it's a bit <laughs> difficult. Um, uh, but we do have contributions. It's just that mm, people think, okay, it's an Android app, it's simple. But actually, it's a fairly complex bit of code. And there's a lot of things which you yeah, have It has to almost, it, I mean, it, it's not, not much less lines of code compared to, to the ID editor, so. Yeah, but and, that, just... and that doesn't include stuff that I've written which is not actually in the main repository. So it's <laughs> actually a bit more than that. <laughs> So there's another mobile editor for, for iOS called GoMap. Is that anything like similar to Vespucci or like totally different things? Yes and no. I mean, it it's targets the same kind of audience. So it's people on the go which want to do more than just add a POI. So there's a point of interest. So there, there's a similar audience. Um, Otherwise, there's not really any similarities. Um, GoMap was closed source up to about two years ago, so there's also no code sharing or anything like that. But I do know the developer, and we're on cordial terms, um, right. and uh, that's about it. I think in general, you will find that there's not that much interaction between the editor developers in general. So we're all a bit competitive <laughs> right. and trying to out-feature the others. What's the, what's the main challenge? I mean, the, uh, doing uh, an editor for the small screen or, or editing on the small screen uh, compared to uh, like Josem and ID who have uh, available, who have much more uh, screen real estate available. And, um, I think the thing is, from a pure functionality point of view, you're not really limited by the small device because they're essentially as powerful as full-size computers were just a couple of years ago. But cramming stuff into the user interface is a big issue, and it's one which we continuously fight with. And I, I think we've made a lot of improvements, particularly in the last two years, making it easier to use. But we do have these, you know, you select a way and you get, I don't know, 20 menu items or something like that, which is really not a good idea. But currently, we don't have another method of presenting the op available options to the end user. But there are some ideas around, so it's always getting simpler and simpler to use. How long, how long until I can just take a photo of something with my smartphone and then it maps it automatically? Uh, difficult to ask. I mean, I've experimented actually a couple of years back with taking photographs of street signs, or, or, well, of street signs, street name signs, um, and that is surprisingly difficult to actually turn into something which you can use. So you always, it's very easy to get 
appropriate results. But if you have to go back in and actually correct stuff, it's more work than just typing it in directly yourself. So that. Mm. Can you name a cool feature that you have implemented in the last year or so that way you said that that's, that really has improved Vespucci a lot? Well, as a rule, I only add cool features. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, uh, about a month ago, um, I have to say it as an explanation, we just have a, a new beta release out. So there's a lot of new stuff which is not available in the release version but you can go on the Google Play Store and sign up for the beta program and you will get all the newest bugs. <laughs> and a, a month ago, I was editing something nearby um, uh, industrial area where I live. Now I realized all the land use was glued to the motorway there. And uh, for the newcomers, that is not something that you should do. It looks very neat, but it's very impractical. And I was on my mobile phone at the time, and I started ungluing it. And this is not a typical use case for, for, and for Vespucci on Android, because the screen is small. And so I was ungluing these nodes, and said, this just doesn't work. And so when I got back, I added a further feature to this release, where you can unglue two ways. Now, you can do that in Josm and in the other editors, but the, tw the, the tweak that I put in is that it actually only unglues stuff which is not the same as the way that you're ungluing. So if you're ungluing a street, all the street connections will be maintained. And it works surprisingly well, and I would probably use that now instead of using Josm, which I would normally <laughs> do. <laughs> so, yeah, and I think the, the corollary from that is, you know, if you want want something done in, in Vespucci, you have better chances if it correlates with an itch that I have. But I'll consider other stuff as well. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, now uh, we have a round for, uh, we have questions for uh, all three of you. No, no, you, you can't go just yet. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We, we, we still have some t topics left for you. Um, so, um, yeah, as, as writers, as developers of, of editors, do you get a lot of feedback from, oh, thanks. Um, do you get a lot of feedback for your work? Do you get praise, critique, feature requests, and so on? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, pretty much every day, people are posting on the ID GitHub page about uh, features they want or bugs they find. Uh, and it's a really exciting part of the project because my old job was also open source, but we didn't have anybody showing up complaining. So <laughs> people are noticing you and definitely uh, relying and being passionate about the project when they show up and talk about it. So um, yes. OK. Uh, yeah, of course, we receive a lot of feature requests and bug reports. But uh, even if sometimes uh, we can find it, so, sorry. Okay. Uh, even if you can find it sometimes overwhelming, uh, the community is very welcoming and very polite, and they often thank us for the work we do. So it's always a pleasure to uh, to have feedback. Okay. Um, I, I have a problem that the other, my two colleagues here don't have because I have. Google Play Store, <laughs> which is a cesspool of aggressivity. Uh, and uh, unluckily, uh, we have people which um, you know, install the app for whatever reason. It doesn't work on their device or there's a, a, an issue. And they will give you a one-star review. And um, I'll just give you an example. Just got a complaint that somebody was complaining that the imagery that we display was out of date. <laughs> and it's nothing that we can change. And uh, the, the problem is that there's no real method to give these people feedback. And typically, they will just go away. And, and that's a bit of an annoying thing. People which uh, ask for proper enhancements on our GitHub repo are very welcome. And as some of you probably know, we are relatively good in actually doing these things. 
So go to GitHub, not yeah. to Google Play Store. Exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, when you do some mapping, I guess all of you do some mapping with OpenStreetMap, um, do you use only your own editor or you do, do you try out the others as well? <laughs> well, I was, I was interested in this. I went on um, how did I contribute to OSM. It's yeah. a cool tool. You can kind of see a summary of a user. And all my 1,500 change sets are an ID, so I'm a little embarrassed to say that. <laughs> I have Jossum installed. I don't have an Android phone, unfortunately. Um, but uh, we definitely like, like I, I like looking at, I've probably read the documentation for Jossum more than I've uh, used Jossum itself. Um, I like looking at how other um, tools work when I'm working on, a, on an app. Um, so that's something I'll have to commit to to uh, start. Uh, a better diversity in my editing. <laughs> well, it's quite the same for me. I have 100% contribution using Josem. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But um, uh, it's the same. Uh, I often read the release notes of ID because you have a lot of good ideas uh, the, which we can copy uh, in Josem. And uh, you, good, uh, you make a good job of uh, communication to explain what, ju what are the changes. So. I don't actually need to use it to to have good ideas. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think you're not doing all your edits on your mobile phone, I guess. Oh, I suppose I could do most of it, but, <laughs> but actually I, I'm completely different than my colleagues because I think I've actually used every single editor in OpenStreetMap space which is been a general purpose editor outside of Mercator, which nobody knows about anymore. Have anyway. you used level zero? Ah, uh, yes. Okay, good. Uh, so, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, day to day use, I do a lot with Vespucci because I believe in dog fooding. So, um, you know, it is still the case that I find the most bugs myself. Um, but I use JOSM and ID, and uh, last week I was using Potlatch One. So, one? Yeah. No, most people don't know how to actually start that, so. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> okay, one more uh, closing question. What is the next big feature you guys are working on? Uh, yeah, well, with ID, we're, um, well, I was just at the State of the Map US conference. I did a big talk on ID3, which is going to be the next major version, maybe within a year, maybe not. We'll see when that actually gets out. But that'll have some more advanced features, like picking the feature type before you draw it. Um, a contextual toolbar, so we can have advanced tools when you have specific things selected. But still try to keep it um, fairly uh, user friendly, but do have more advanced features. So uh, check out that talk and uh, keep an eye out for that. For Josem, the next big um, feature uh, is not a visible feature for end users. Uh, if you remember the number of lines of code we have for JOSAM, it's uh, very high. And all of these lines are basically a single piece of software, so it's becoming more and more difficult to maintain. And we would like to offer all the work we did uh, in Java programming language to available to other Java developers for different use cases. So the next big feature is to modularize JOSAM into smaller components, autonomous, uh, and this is a major effort uh, uh, that is going to take years before we reach to this goal. Okay. Um, it's not very much different with Vespucci. There's a lot of work which doesn't actually result in user visible changes. Uh, typically, once per year, I have to invest a couple of man weeks, or not even perhaps a, a man month, just to fulfill and fix changes that Google uh, requires or, or stuff that Google has broken. Um, for 14.1, 14.0 is the version which is in beta now. 14.1 will probably have mapillary support. I've already prototy prototyped that. And um, depending on time, there's a anybody who's used Vespucci knows that you select the element and then you can start a tag editor on that element. And that is actually, it's not quite a separate process which is running on your phone, but very similar. And the idea is to do away with that. That goes actually, that's an architectural decision that was made 10 years ago, so not my fault. <laughs> um, 
and but it makes it a bit difficult to show the tags in any other context. So if you have an Android tablet, right now you either have the map or you have the tag display. And the idea is that you can have the map and the tag display at the same time. Okay. And so that will be a user visible t uh, change if Android tablets are still a thing, which I'm not quite sure of. <laughs> okay, thank you three guys, Quincy, Vincent, Simon. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Level zero. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, okay. Okay. What's what's the next big thing in level zero? Level zero is perfect. There will be no big things because it's already a big thing. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Are you giving a talk about level zero? No. <laughs> right. So, uh, if you want to learn more uh, about any of those editors, uh, or at least two of those have talks um, uh, during the next de uh, days. So, there is um, the ID Editor Beginner Tutorial tomorrow at 11.30. And there will be also a talk about the JOSM project tomorrow at 2 p.m. Yeah. So, what you've, what you've heard about now are the various editors in OpenStreetMap that uh, are, of course, a very important part of contributing to OpenStreetMap because you need to go through one of these editors to actually uh, upload something. However, that technical side isn't all. OpenStreetMap is very much a community project. And uh, we have lots of people not only sitting at home um, on their computers and adding stuff, but also people meeting up and um, doing things together for OpenStreetMap, people organizing community events, and so on. So, um, oh, sorry, one second. I uh, lost my script. Please welcome Jonathan Bellien from the Belgium community, who's going to tell you a few bits about what the Belgians do to organize their editing and to meet up and to do other things. Hello, Jonathan. Hello. Um, so you are one of the most active uh, members of the OpenStreetMap Belgium group? At least right? the community. Uh, uh, the community. Yeah, the community, yeah. community right. Um, so um, what kind of organ organized activities do you do in, in Belgium? Well, we do drink a lot of beers together. That's <laughs> obvious. <laughs> uh, so no, we organize yeah, regular uh, meetups so we can meet the people from the community, but also newcomers that just heard about OpenStreetMap and can yeah, come to ask questions, so, so that's, that's really nice. Um, and we, we do try to organize a lot of uh, mapathons. Uh, we have a close relation with uh, MSF, uh, Doctors Without Borders, in, uh, in Belgium. And so, yeah, we try to support them for their uh, humanitarian effort. Uh, yeah, that's basically the main things we do right now. And you also had a set of the map a few years ago. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how frequently do you do uh, such events? Uh, for the meetups, we try to do once a month and in each part of the country, so people okay. can join more easily. Well, we are a small country, so we can <laughs> join easily everywhere, basically, but we try to do uh, a bit everywhere. Uh, and mapathons will start in back, and I would say, yeah, every three months or so, something like that. So we try to do, we'll try now to do more often events uh, related to OpenStreetMap. Okay, when did you start with OpenStreetMap Belgium? Uh, well, I joined later, but the community started uh, around 2013, I think. Okay. So, how many people do you attract? How, how much? How many uh, are joining? And it really depends on the events. The meetup is usually 10, 15 people, uh, just yeah, gathering, having a good drink, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and a uh, yeah, a nice evening together. But the mapathons goes from yeah, 20 people to 200. So it really depends on, on the event and, okay. and the state of the map was a was bit three large, yes, <laughs> a bit larger. Yeah. Yeah. So there, are there any special challenges that you have in Belgium? So I think uh, maybe language barrier yeah, is yeah, kind of a thing. That's a big one. So yeah, we speak French, uh, Dutch, and German in, in Belgium. 
So that's in English, I guess. And yeah, we decided to do everything in English because <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, it's easy for everyone. But that's still an issue because some people do not join the community because it's in English and they don't feel comfortable enough uh, speaking or uh, writing in English. So we try. We use English as default, but we try, we try to include every language. So anyone can join and ask their question in their own language, and we'll try to... There's probably to, someone else who... Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, the community is enough to be able to reply in every language. Okay. So is there something you're particularly proud of that you achieved with the community? Well, you mentioned State of the Map. That yeah. was obviously in a big one. State of the Map 2016 was in Brussels. So, yeah, that's... Was that's, a, a that's big a big achievement. Okay. Uh, but we're also really proud of uh, having people with a lot of well, a lot of backgrounds. Not only software developers or GIS people in the community. We really have people from yeah every background. So that's really nice. Even for the discussion, uh, to have people from that that are not developers, certain not GIS people. Okay, that's cool. Mm. And what are the plans for the future? Do you have some upcoming events that uh, you're looking forward uh, to? Yeah, we try to. So the Open Knowledge Belgium uh, organization, let's say, organize Open Belgium every every year. And we, re we use that as a small state of the map Belgium. So we have a, a dedicated track uh, about OpenStreetMap inside the Open Belgium conference. And as I said, we try now to do more regular uh, events. But so more patterns, meetups, but also more you know, workshops, let's say, uh, about uh, related to OpenStreetMap. OK, very cool. Yeah, thank you for joining. My thank pleasure. you for answering questions. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jonathan. You. Yeah, what's, what Jonathan has outlined there is, in many ways, the original way of how OpenStreetMap was done by the community. Mostly hobbyists, uh, geeks, often computer geeks, meeting up, uh, doing things in their spare time, um, often just to scratch an itch or generate a better alternative to existing uh, commercial maps. But there are also places on Earth where commercial maps don't even exist, and where creating them is perhaps not just a hobby activity, but also can be a matter of public safety. And uh, for this humanitarian aspect of OpenStreetMap, uh, we have invited Janet Chapman from the Tanzania Development Trust, and we're going to ask her a few questions. Hello, Janet. Hello, uh, thank you for inviting me. Have you come from Tanzania right now? Uh, no, I've come. Well, I've come from Humanitarian Open Street Map Conference uh, two days ago. Um, <laughs> right. um, um, before that, I was in London. But I, I do spend usually about two months a year in rural Tanzania. So Tanzania is probably not the kind of country where, like, bicycle geeks in Open Street Map try to improve the cycling network or something. What mm. kind of mapping do you do down there? Yeah, I, th I think cycling's quite challenging in a lot of uh, Tanzania because the roads are really poor. Um, so um, I've been a volunteer with Tanzania Development Trust for the last six years, and when I started visiting projects there in rural Tanzania, I quickly realized that the maps were almost non-existent, so you could have settlements of 10,000 people that just didn't exist um, on on. OpenStreetMap, um, and we work a lot with um, activists who are helping protect girls from female genital mutilation um, in rural Tanzania, and so their lack of maps of the surrounding areas where the girls are at risk was really hampering their work. So for the last four years, um, I've, we've been mapping rural Tanzania for community development, but also to help protect girls from female genital mutilation, FGM. Hmm. Many, um, many of the projects in the humanitarian sector rely relatively heavily on uh, people in Western countries uh, doing lots of tracing of mm -hmm. roads and building stuff from aerial imagery. Is that also a cornerstone of the work you're doing? or? Um, yes, absolutely, because um, we're also training people on the ground in rural Tanzania to use very cheap smartphones to add points of 
points of um, information, for example, village names, uh, clinics, schools, etc. But it's very, very difficult to do that if, the, if the, um, there's no base layer. Um, so you're relying on your phone's GPS and you're just looking at a completely blank screen without any roads or buildings on it. So we're relying on um, online volunteers uh, to do the tracing of roads and buildings. So we've got around um, 13,000 13, um, online volunteers from all around the world have helped us um, over the last four years to create that base map. Um, we've added around 3.9 million buildings. Um, we've still got quite a long way to go though, so if anyone's interested in uh, helping us, then please let me know. Um, so we get the majority of our um, on volunteers from UN online volunteering. Um, most of them are completely new to OpenStreetMap. They've never even heard of OpenStreetMap. Um, we have a Slack channel that has over 3,000 people in it where um, more, ad more advanced mappers give people individual advice and coaching on their first map edits. So, you know, we've, I think we've been quite successful in bringing a lot of new people into the community. Um, we also work really closely with Missing Maps in London um, who meet every fortnight. Um, so they've also been a great source of uh, help. We've also set up um, Youth Mapper chapters in four different universities in Tanzania, so um, we're really trying to build up local expertise. So we've done a lot of training on the ground in Tanzania, um, mostly with people using Maps.me um, on smartphones, which is great because it also works offline, so they can download um, the app, download the map of Tanzania, and then add points and then when they have connectivity they can upload them so that's been that's basically how we work do people sometimes also surprise you with mapping things that you didn't expect them to <laughs> yes well i mean generally english is the third language of the mappers that we're um, training in rural tanzania um, and sometimes th I think things get lost in translation. So, for example, I noticed in one area, um, somebody was adding pet shops everywhere. Um, th there aren't pet shops in rural Tanzania. So, um, I had a discussion with him, and it, basically what we would call a convenience store, for some reason he thought it was a pet shop. So, right. um, and then there were, there were other, th other th random things. So, yeah. Do, do people... Uh do people all have uh, or use the map with mobile phones locally or is that, or, or do they often have like, I don't know, I, I, I have never been to rural Tanzania, so is, is there anything like a village computer that people can share or do they use printed maps or? Um, generally, the, generally you don't see printed maps uh, very often at all. So if you, if you go, for example, to the uh, district council, you know, the district medical officer, the district educational officer, they would never have maps of mm -hmm. their district. Um, we, so we're starting to try and produce printed maps, but we're a network of volunteers and we're running on a shoestring. So print, printing maps it, you know, has some ex expense to it and also distribution and so on. So um, generally people don't have access to laptops very much, so the vast majority of people are using um, phones. So we've done a lot of training with um, particularly police officers, um, so to, to get them to install maps.me um, on their phones. So because in um, the F how the protection against FGM works, there's a cutting season um, in the long school holiday, generally December, and the, the police and the activists will get a phone call in the middle of the night saying there's girls about to be cut in this village. Um, previously that village wasn't on any, any map, so we're training them to use maps.me to be able to route to that place so that they can protect those girls. Right. You mentioned the shoestring budget. Who funds the work that you do? Okay, so we had um, a micro-grant from Humanitarian OpenStreetMap uh, two years ago. Um, that was $5,000. Um, and we're doing a bit of work with uh, the Women Connect project, but most of, the, most of the funding has come from individual donations. Right. Thanks a lot for this 
small insight. I think you have uh, a lightning talk today, later today, about the work that you do? Yes, I do at uh, two o'clock. And if, anyone, if anyone's interested in helping in any way, we're always particularly looking for validators, um, then please get in touch. Our website is crowd2map with the number two. Um, and my email is j.chapman at Tans Dev Trust. So I'm always really um, looking forward to talking to other people. Thank you. Now, uh, we already have demonstrated how e easy it is to um, introduce new people to OSM and um, you might surely think, okay, the, all those new people, they will probably generate some, some mistakes also. Uh, exactly in, true, OpenStreetMap is full of bugs, you know that. I mean, uh, non-square buildings, POIs in the middle of the road, highways going the uh, one way, streets going the wrong way, rivers flow, flowing uphill, all these things, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 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 but OSM is made by people, so people make mistakes, but we also take quality assurance very seriously. And um, yeah, there's uh, error detection everywhere. And um, our next guest operates one of those quality assurance systems. And um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, Frederic Rodrigo. Hi. Hi. Um, so you run a site called uh, Osmosa. Yeah. And um, this shows, uh, this analyzes uh, OSM data for all kinds of issues and uh, potential problems and so on. Um, what, of, what kind of issues do you find? What, what, what do you show there? Uh, there is, um, as Frederick tells, uh, many kind of issues uh, like typo, like uh, unconnected, uh, a way uh, like uh, highway uh, crossing a highway, highway on a railway without a connection on the same level. There is something strange, uh, like uh, uh, bad direction on on boot. There is a lot, a lot of mistake, the ge uh, geometric mistake, uh, tag mistake. Uh, there is a lot of possibilities. Okay, maybe you can you can show us quickly sure. how how it looks like. Uh, so, uh, there is a map with a lot of uh, pins. Each pin is an issue. An issue is a possible problem, but um, only possible. It's not a bug, it's not uh, sure there is something to do. Um, so, I zoom a bit. Um, and um, on the left, there is a lot of uh, items. Each time is a kind of issue. Uh, you can select uh, issue by uh, severity. Uh, the severity is um, impact in the map. So the best way is uh, starting with uh, high severity. Each pin um, have a description about uh, what is uh, supposed wrong. Uh, so I pick a random issue is about um, combination um, of uh, leisure uh, natural. Uh, so it's not maybe it's not a, pro a problem here. Uh, so here um, another issue about the max max speed uh, that uh, is not supposed to be um, 80 uh, in the Germany rural area. So each time there is a description, the tags, and the possibilities to open the object uh, in um, osm.org or um, on uh, editors. Okay, 
So if I now go ahead and fix such an issue, how long will it take to show up on Osmosis? You can uh, check the issue um, on the green or um, tell there, there is no issue here. And then uh, when you, uh, on your side, um, send the data to the openstreetmap.org, uh, in the next day, we uh, recheck all the world and then it's updated. Even if you um, fix data without close the pin, uh, the update uh, simply uh, cleans the map. Okay. So, um, how many issues do you have in Osmosa? A lot. Worldwide? A lot. Uh, there is uh, 16, uh, 60 um, uh, million of issues <laughs> uh, of all severities. But, 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 uh, there is a priority with severity and there is only uh, four million of uh, first priority. Okay, that, that's still quite a lot <laughs> of issues. Do, is, it, is it frustrating to see so many errors, or do you think, oh, that's rewarding? Ah, that's no, that's no, it's a chance. Uh, <laughs> more we have data, more we have issue. Um, and there is not always something important to fix. Um, more, uh, more we add tags, more we add data, more we have issues, and also more we know about the issue and what we want on the data, what we want to be good, we add rules. So more we add rules, more we have issue too. The good way is um, we know about the issue and where the data is good or not. So having issue, having pins, it's a good way to focus. Okay, but in nowadays, uh, most editors do already their own checking, their own validation. Is there more stuff that you do with Osmosa that those editors don't do? Or do you think, yeah, in the future, all the editors will do it on their own and there will be nothing to do for you? Now you can go. Yeah, it's not the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, um, on the editor, you show an uh, issue on the data you are, um, you are working on. So you, uh, you load a small area and you are uh, view um, issue on the small area or uh, issue on the data yourself are uh, changing. Here, uh, we are running rules around the world every day. So we, uh, we uh, show the issue where they are and uh, the contributor can go to this area to fix the issue of uh, this own issue, of the other issue done by uh, other people, or when we add new rules, uh, there are not already here in the past, fix issue of the past. And um, so the both uh, way um, are, um, are interesting and, and needing. No. Okay. Um, right, so um, is there any other tooling that you would suggest uh, apart from Osmosa to find maybe problems with, uh, with the uh, changes you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is other tools with other rules, so other issues. So uh, the small number of issues uh, marked from Osmos are not all the issues, sure. Uh, the other tools are the keep right and uh, some inspector. They are uh, similar to Osmos. Uh, but there is another uh, kind of um, tools uh, based on the changes. Here is only checking the data as they are in the OpenStreetMap database. Uh, there is an um, OSM chair uh, checking the changes. So uh, we can um, uh, review the changes made by uh, other uh, contributors and uh, checking only the changes. Okay. So Thanks a lot for, for, for the answers. Thanks a lot for your work on Osmosa. Thanks, Federico. <laughs>
Hello. Would you say you're a cartographer? Among other things. So actually my degree is in chemistry. So I feel really comfortable here with the chalkboards and the, the sinks hidden behind here as well to wash away the chemicals. So yeah, but I, I do cartography and also software development and other things. Right. They, when, when, when I invited you here, you said that others can probably <laughs> say more about the current state of, um, of the map on OpenStreetMap, but you were involved uh, quite a lot in the beginnings. Can sure. you tell us what the OpenStreetMap Carto project is? So the OpenStreetMap Carto project is the current set of rules that convert the map data into the visual map that you see, so the, the colors and, and so on. And I, I played a part in that project of creating it back in 2012 based on an existing map style. So my work was partly technology and also partly cartography. Um, but as you say, there's a lot of other people involved now. It's got a, um, six other maintainers and a whole bunch of people who, who create um, issues and, and work on the project too. Right, so the, so, so the, the, the project overall is this idea, we've got the data in the database that we've talked about and we want to see that data on a map. And so certain decisions need to be made, like what color should things be? How wide should a road look? What zoom levels should things appear on? And these rules are collected together in the for and we call them style sheets or map style sheets. And that's what OpenStreetMap Carto is. So OpenStreetMap Carto basically de decides what gets on the map. And it's not, when I add something in an editor, say like a, a shop, uh, a candlestick maker or something, you know, uh, some specialist thing, um, it doesn't necessarily appear on the map. Yeah, that's right. We can't show every piece of information that's in OpenStreetMap on the one map. So what if I want a map that has all the things? <laughs> they, there's some things like opening hours. These, these are important and useful, and you, you see them on an application when you click on something. But if we wrote the opening hour of every restaurant across the map, it would be a complete mess. So whenever we're creating the map, we need to choose not only what features we want to show on the map, but what attributes we're going to look at, which tags we're going to look at in order to show those features. You were the creator of one of the first special purpose OpenStreetMap maps, the OpenCycle map. So apparently it's quite possible to take OpenStreetMap data and make special maps that are for one particular purpose sure. or that show something particular. Can you maybe show us on, on the browser uh, a couple of examples in how some, something like the open cycle map differs from the standard map? Just open this thing up for you. Yeah, let's, let's have a look. So you can change the map layers on OpenStreetMap. Um, we have a few available. And, and the cycle map is a project that I started um, back in 2007. And so changing to that layer, we see, we see a few changes. We show bike parking. We highlight where, um, you, which paths you can cycle on. And we show where the cycle routes are. And so your kind of mental map of what Heidelberg looks like could be quite different depending on whether you're interested in cycling or you're driving through town where the, the um, motorways are more important. Or if you're taking public transport, you want to see where the bus routes are or you're more interested in where the railways and the trams go. So all of these different map layers are all based on the same OpenStreetMap data. It's just, it's not possible to show all the features at the same time. If you think of one road that has six bus routes and a bike route and uh, two long distance road networks and, and a hiking path all down the same street, you can't show all of those at the same time. So having different map layers allows us to highlight different features. Are those four map layers the, the only map layers that there are? No, as we talked about earlier, the planet files are released so anybody can, can make their own map layers. Um, these are just four that have been chosen to, to demonstrate um, the possibilities. But there are hundreds and hundreds of different map styles for different people as well, like for hiking or for whitewater rafting or for, for all kinds of different purposes. If someone wanted to make their own map, like if someone were to start today and wanted to make something like Open Cycle Map or something, uh, what, what kind of tools or what kind of software would you recommend that they start using for that? 
That's a really hard question because <laughs> so the software that I would choose might not be uh, everybody's cup of tea. So um, w for the projects that I use, it involves OSM to PGSQL for converting the data ready for, for rendering. And then software like Mapnik, which is a, a map rendering library that uh, can, can create these map images. Right. Thank you very much, Andy Allen, Never for this few words about map making. OK, now, um, making maps is one way in, in which the data, can, the data in OpenStreetMap is used. Um, another very important thing, uh, and you see that here while the browser is open, another very important thing um, is searching. Um, you, you have a, a, an input box here, and you can put in, like, Karlsruhe, Karlsruhe, and it'll go away from Heidelberg and go to Karlsruhe. Um, the, the process of converting uh, a search term, like an address or a place name, into a geo-coordinate, or even maybe, in this case, a polygon, is called geocoding. And the geocoding software that is used on the OpenStreetMap website is called Nominatim. And who better to ask questions about Nominatim than the maintainer of Nominatim, Sarah Hoffman. <laughs> Hello, Sarah. Hello. You're not only the maintainer of, uh, the open, of the Nominatum software, but you're also the sysadmin uh, looking after the service. How many, how many searches does the OpenStreetMap website run every day? Um, also, the website itself, actually, it's quite a small part that the server gets. So we get about 25 million requests per day. So at the peak time, that's 500 requests per second. But actually, only a small part comes from the, the website itself. So that's about one per second. Um, right. Yeah. And, and, and of course, because it's open source software, everyone can install the software for themselves. But do you have any idea how many people run their own nominatums? Well, not too much, because they don't tell. But actually, there is a little piece of data. We are using Wikidata data, uh, Wikipedia data, which you have to download when you want to install your own uh, installation. And we're seeing that there are about a dozen downloads per day. So probably some of them just trying them out, but you can do the math even if just one of them actually installs it. There's probably thousands of them around, yeah. The original developer of Nominatum was Brian Queen, and then you took over from him as some, at some point as the maintainer. How did you become interested in hacking on Nominatum? Actually, I started with the system administration. So in, I think, 2011, the OSM Foundation bought a new server for geocoding. And um, it was sitting there because Brian didn't have the time. And I had never done something with Nominatum, but thought, well, what the heck? And I asked if I can help out. And to my utter surprise, actually, Tom Hughes, the main system administrator, just told me, here's the root password. Tell me when I can switch the main side to the new server. And <laughs> So basically, that's how it started. And then, of course, I started um, also improving the software. And at some point, Brian did other stuff. And I basically became the main maintainer. Now, geocoding doesn't sound too hard. I mean, there's just, there's just a list of lots of addresses. And I put them all in a database. And then when someone searches for something, I just pull out the right record. And that's it. It's the basic principle, yes. So. The problem is a little bit of scale. So we're having a planet-wide database. And at the moment, that's about 250 million entries, which your little table has. The other problem is, of course, we're not having addresses directly in OSM. So some objects do have, where we have house numbers and address tags. But mostly, you actually have to compute the address yourself. And that's a large part of what Nominatum is doing. And even when you once have computed the data, that's not enough because mappers want to have their data fresh. If they map anything, they want to have it immediately searchable. So we have to do minutely updates. And all this adds up to a lot of, um, lot of work you have to do and uh, a lot of optimizations you have to do. A slide from a talk that you did a couple of years ago said, I, I still remember that, it said, 
it is easy to write a geocoder that is right 80% of the time. What are the other 20%? What, is, what, what are the different difficult cases? Yeah, so uh, the stuff I didn't touch on now is actually finding the stuff. And doing this for the planet is actually quite difficult. So you can write a geocoder which, for example, for Germany, just finds the addresses. That's easy. There is uh, exactly one format you know about what people are going to do. And it's relatively easy to write this. So going the other 20% saying, OK, let's extend this to the entire world. That's where it gets difficult. Or another example is somebody wrote a geocoder and said, left out the house numbers and said, oh, that's just an easy exercise. But actually, that's half of the data, because house numbers is the stuff that's really, really adds up to a lot. The, um, what's life like as a, the, the maintainer of Nominatum? Do you, do you develop new features all the time? or? Unfortunately not. So I'm also doing this basically in my spare time. And nowadays, it's a lot answering issues and just fixing smaller bugs, uh, changing stuff under the hood. I mean, the OSM that has really grown a lot in the last years. And we're still running the whole stuff on a single server. So there's a lot of work going into optimizing the database, optimizing the search, and so on. Do you have something like a wish list where you say, I would really love someone to develop this feature or submit a patch for this something or so? Uh, of course. There's a, there's a couple of things uh, on GitHub. Uh, one of the things I'd really, really love to see finally is on the OpenStreetMap website's uh, search as you type. So you get suggestions, basically, while you're typing your search. Um, we actually have the parts for this. So there is Photon, which is another geocoder which can do this. And it's mostly a question of integration. But yeah, that's something I'd like to see. We actually did um, suggest this for the Google Sum of Code this year. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't find a student for it. But that's one of the things which uh, would be nice. Any, any pro tips if I, if I want to search on OpenStreetMap uh, in, to, to maximize my chances of actually finding what I'm looking for? Well, the one pro tip is uh, use commas. So if you're typing your address uh, and add commas in between the different parts, then the chances are a lot better that Nominatum will do the right thing and find your, uh, what you're searching okay. for. OK, thank you very much, Sarah, for giving us a quick welcome. Yeah, so you have seen now Nominatim, uh, which is a very specific kind of search. So if you need some specific place, you will get exactly this. But that's not the only strength of OSM. With OSM, you can actually uh, do whatever you want. You can do all kinds of searches, and you can actually get the raw data. Uh, for example, you can download the whole planet file that we described uh, at the beginning of the talk. Um, you can import it into a database and then do all sorts of SQL queries on, on top of that. Yeah. Um, you, can, you can search whatever you want, basically. But OSM has a lot of data, so it might actually be not that easy to do it. And, um, but there are other ways that are uh, hosted by OpenStreetMap. And long time ago, there has been XAPI. And um, then in 2011, uh, Roland Eubricht um, built the Overpass API, which is a query language and query engine that um, gives you the opportunity to search for any data that you want. And um, yeah, Overpass is really cool, but it didn't have a user interface, so adoption was really slow. But luckily, like two years later or so, um, Martin Reifer uh, came along and uh, built an interface for that Overpass Turbo. And that's what we want to go. What we're going to talk about now, Martin. Hi, Martin. Overpass Turbo is basically just a, uh, an interface to the uh, backend query engine Overpass. Um, yet most people use Overpass Turbo, and few people use Overpass directly. So. Uh, you get all the praise. Do you, do you and Roland, the inventor of the uh, overpass, still get along well? Or? Well, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, it's also a kind of um, um, a good situation that we find each other, that we can benefit from each other. So I was, uh, I'm glad that I don't have to do all this hard backend stuff. 
the database administration and uh, keeping up with the servers and the, the, the demand from the users. And on the other hand, he's glad, I think, that he doesn't have to worry about uh, creating the user interface for it. Now, the overpass query language, overpass has a couple of query languages, and they're all a bit difficult to learn. Has, d does overpass turbo mean I don't have to learn any of them? Well, basically, it gives you a starting point. So there are, it comes with a couple of examples preloaded pre that you can look at and learn from. And there's also, um, not since the beginning, but at some point I thought it's, uh, it really needs some kind of helping mechanism for people that are starting to do some, some basic queries more easily. So therefore, I added a component called the wizard to can the you, website. Can you uh, can give us it? an yeah. example? Yeah. I'll um, just uh, put this up for you. It, like the wizard is a bit similar to a search box that you have on OpenStreetMap. It allows you to, yeah, to just enter a short phrase, a search phrase, and can you do something out. like I don't know, yeah. post boxes or something, or yeah, thanks. So basically, it already knows about uh, the OSM tags. And um, not all of them, but a couple, so important stuff like a post box would already be found. If you just press enter, then it gives you the query for, for loading all the post boxes from OpenStreetMap onto your map view here. And then you can, yeah, you can click on individual ones and get some additional details, for example, some names or whatever. And yeah, we can also go to a different location and run the query again to get the post boxes for the respective area. Can I also do something like, so this, is, this now runs on the whole area that I see on the screen. Mm -hmm. Can I also do something like, okay, I, I only want within the city boundaries of Heidelberg or something? Yeah, that's also possible. So even in the wizard, you can tell them that give me the mailboxes in I don't know. And then it fetches the area and afterwards all the post boxes in this area from overpass. That's really cool. Can I, yeah. can I, can I also do something like all post boxes within two kilometers of the university or something like that? Yeah, this is already stretching the power of the wizards, <laughs> but it's still possible. Um, what you would write is not in Heidelberg, but around. And I will write here. And let it build my query. And now you can specify here a radius. Uh, the default is one kilometer. I can change it to two, and this would be now all the post boxes around here in a radius of two kilometers. This but if you want to go into more detail, the overpass query language can do much more. Uh, you see on the left, it's the query. And you're always free to still modify it and add uh, more stuff to learn about the query language and program your queries yourself. Right, so the examples that we have now seen are basically the extent that, that you can go to with a wizard without knowing anything about the yeah, query exactly. language. And basically, if you want, you can do still more complex things, but that's the point where then you, you will have to read the docs at one point. Yeah, exactly. At some point, um, the old part is, uh, API is also meant to be used for creating own applications, and that's more meant for developers. Mm -hmm. And that's also a very strong point of the OPAS API, that you can use it in your own applications to create uh, new apps, for example, or websites or maps. Right. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh. Yeah, unfortunately, our time is already up. Uh, so um, thank you for coming. Um, I hope it was entertaining. I hope you learned something. I hope you engaged now, you now feel uh, um, motivated to do something with OpenStreetMap. We hope you learned something and um, yeah, thanks for joining us. A big
big thank you to our guests again for coming and for helping us make this entertaining. Um, our guests. Yeah.